Under the Portuguese EU presidency, the European Commission has developed a long-term vision for rural areas. A vision that involves people into the design of their future and ensures green and just recovery for all rural areas. ESPON identifies the challenges and the trends for rural areas and links them with the EU Territorial Agenda 2030 and the priorities of the Portuguese Presidency. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to open the ESPON seminar promoted by the Portuguese Presidency and particularly to contribute to an emerging debate in Europe the green and just recovery for all European territories. In fact, having a vision for all European territories is nowadays a huge challenge. The pandemic had such a disruptive impact on our societies that it is impossible to think that any recover or normality means a return to old formulas of Polish governance. It is time to act. We must respond to the deep economic and social crisis we face using knowledge, resilience, co-creation processes and direct involvement of citizens. And we must think strategically <coughs> about what we want, which European house we want to build. Building the European house means, now more than ever, thinking about territories and to do it by responding to climatic, social and environmental challenges. But also to think about the emerge of risks, whether they be pandemic or others. This means involving our citizens, providing their needs and reducing inequalities. The European home we want to live in is an inclusive home, energy efficient, with a culture of diversity and multiculturalism truly committed to social and territorial cohesion. This is a historical turning point in which both Social Europe and Green Europe are high on the list of priorities. R reality has shown that without fulfilling Social Europe, we do not achieve resilient development and without Green Europe, we do not achieve sustainable economic development. Let me give you an example about Portugal. We have a serious commitment to the territorial development and circular economy, which we consider a pillar of a new economic order. Making the reuse of resources an instrument to generate new and more skilled jobs is a transverse measure in public policies aiming at the decarbonization objectives in 2050. We are doing it. Our sustainable development strategy is based on decarbonization, on energy transition, pursuing a more competitive and resilient development model that values natural resources and with them the natural value present in each territory. Portugal is one of the European countries where climate change has the greatest impact. And this fact, visible from year to year, has generated a national alert that claims, be smart. Therefore, our national program for spatial planning policy has a long-term vision that incorporates the territorial dimension in all sectors and states that, and states that the territory must be at the center of public policies. With this concern very much in mind, we have built our recovery and resilience program where we have tried to find true transformation mechanisms for all territories and, most of all, for rural territories. Experience has shown that whenever we put the knowledge and innovation into processes, we benefit in terms of employment and social and territorial cohesion. We gain in social justice and in the valuation of the resources of each territory, whether natural or social. In fact, we win on the balance between the well-being of our communities and the preservation of territorial values. In this context, the teamwork undertaken by the Portuguese Presidency, Presidency and ESPON in preparation for the policy brief on the long-term vision for rural areas is of great relevance. We have the responsibility of being part of a historic moment that implies a profound transformation of society as we know it. 
only with a new model that recognizes the current global threats, changes consumption and preserves and adds value to resources, we will achieve sustainable recovery. The goal set by Portugal to achieve carbon neutrality implies reducing greenhouse gas emission by more than 85% in relation to 2005 and ensuring a capacity for agriculture and forestry carbon sequestration in the order of 13 million tons. We will only be able to achieve this national goal with a sustainable and resilient agriculture and forestry and this path will only be achieved with the full engagement of local populations and the society in general. The new consumer agenda is also our agenda for a more democratic, inclusive, green and digital Europe. The energy transition and the decarbonization of the economy are an opportunity for Portugal, an opportunity to increase investment, employment and economic growth due to improve competitiveness and sustainability made possible by the energy transition to a carbon-neutral and circular economy. An opportunity for scientific innovation and technological progress as the path to carbon neutrality is also the path of knowledge, creativity and innovation. We have no time to waste. This is the road for the future. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Espon broadcasting live from Digital Azul Studio in Lisbon, Portugal. I'm very happy to host this debate today. My name is Viktor Shedarovsky. I'm the director of the Espon EGTC, the European Grouping for Territorial Cooperation, a single beneficiary and operating body for the EU-funded program called Espon. During the 90 minutes, a bit less than 90 minutes right now, we are going to talk about a very important subject of transition and transformation for rural areas. And this event is organized with the support of the Portuguese Presidency of the Council. This is an important day for the country. Today, the President of the European Commission, Madame Ursula von der Leyen, is, host, is coming to the country, is paying the visit to Portugal to start approving the uh, national recovery plans. And I'm happy to say that Portugal has been the first EU country to adopt its national recovery plan. I have two eminent panelists with me today, Mr. Vasco Cordeiro, who is the uh, Vice President of the European Committee of the Regions, and Mr. Cordeiro has a profound experience of regional work at the regional level, the work with regional imbalances, the, uh, the strategies, the plans, the programs that serve the development of the uh, territories. When being president of the regional government of Azores, and I do believe this was two terms that, you've been the, the, that you were the president, you worked a lot to modernize the economy and support the people of the islands. And thanks to your work, Mr. Cordeiro, Azores entered the international map of classified destinations in nature tourism. And absolutely, you have a solid knowledge of the management of the EU funds. And also, you understand well how to implement the EU programs and also national and regional strategies. And also with me here in the studio, I have Mrs. Anna Sessions who is a Deputy Director General of the Portuguese National Authority for Territory and you have a mandate to design, plan and implement the National Spatial Planning Policy Programme. You also serve in the National Intersectoral Forum that aims to put this programme into practice and also to provide a good bond between the various policy sectors in your country. And Anna is also a full member of the ESPON Programme Monitoring Committee. So welcome to this panel. Mr. Cordeiro is going to join us online from the beautiful islands of Azores and we are very thankful to have you with us here today. So, we've heard some important messages from Minister uh, João Pedro Matos Fernandes, Minister for Environment and Climate Action of Portugal. I will just pick up some of the important words here, co-creation, citizen involvement. So, um, this is also quite essential to understand that right now we have the money, we have the plans, we have the visions, but 
we need to know how to implement it in the best way. And before giving the floor to my panelists, I would like to present to you the video message from the Commission, Vice President of the European Commission, Dubravka Szujca, who will present how the Commission works with the long-term vision for the rural areas. Dear Minister Matos Fernandez, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure for me to address ESPON once again in your week of green and just recovery for all European territories. The Commission's work in demography was launched with the report on the impact of demographic change. It was followed in January of this year by the Green Paper on Aging, and the most evident demographic challenge facing the European Union is aging. This is not just a matter for older people. Everyone is impacted directly by the prospect of living a longer life, including the young. This brings both challenges and opportunities. The long-term vision for rural areas will be published at the end of this month. Our vision aims to be greater than the sum of all its parts. The vision is one of our demography initiatives that underpins both a green and just recovery for all, including rural areas and territories. It complements the European Green Deal, that is Europe's growth strategy. The green and digital transitions go hand in hand with relaunching and modernizing our economies. We cannot do this alone. Together, through Next Generation European Union and the Recovery and Resilience Facility, the European Union and the Member States can pinpoint and deliver investment where most needed. We have now entered the key phase of putting the Recovery and Resilience Facility into effect. What matters now is to ensure the high quality and quick rollout of the national plans so that investment financed under Next Generation EU starts supporting the recovery. Next Generation EU will drive the recovery and the just transition. It supports the transformation of cities and regions through new job opportunities in renewable energy and provides secure connectivity infrastructure that will benefit citizens and businesses of all sizes everywhere. The recovery and resilience plans include a variety of measures aimed at fostering the green transition, including biodiversity, and climate-related measures will account for at least 37% of the funding for each national recovery and resilience plan, and all measures must respect the do no significant harm principle. The digital transformation is a key objective of this facility. Digital-related investments will account for at least 20% of the investments. When it comes to the green and digital transitions, these provide opportunities for recovery that values long-term sustainability while embodying inclusion, equality and territorial cohesion. Digi digital technologies are key enablers in our move towards circularity and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It is essential that these benefits are felt in all corners and regions of Europe, including those areas most affected by the transition to climate neutrality. No one can be left behind. And this brings me to my work in demography and the long-term vision in particular. At the end of this month, better to say on 30th of June, we will present our long-term vision for rural areas, which fits with our overall ambition of a green and just recovery. When we speak about rural areas, we mean 137 million people, representing almost 30% of European Union's population and over 80% of its territory. So how could we even think about a just and green recovery without their input? This vision is all about addressing our common challenges together by building jointly on the emerging opportunities of European Union's green and digital transitions and on the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. It will help us to identify the means to improve rural quality of life, achieve balanced territorial development and stimulate economic growth in rural areas. The resounding message that came from our wide public consultation is that almost 40% of those who replied said they felt left behind by society and policymakers. This perception and the factors driving it must be tackled. 
Populism usually finds fertile ground in this, con in this content and our recent report on the demographic and landsca landscape of European Union territories. And it demonstrates just how much political attitudes and the electoral behaviors may be shaped and influenced by age and place of residence. Democracy is not static. It constantly evolves. Our democracy must be fit for the future in order to strengthen our representative democracy. This is what the Conference on the Future of Europe is all about, bringing citizens into the heart of policy making, including the 137 million European citizens living in rural areas. The vision will help turn the changes in society, including the latest ones caused by COVID-19, into opportunities for rural areas because we need to avoid an asymmetric recovery and ensure that all of the European Union's territories have the means to bounce back equally from the pandemic. It's all about creating a better future, not only for the rural areas, but together with them, while ensuring they maintain their essential rural character. No two rural areas are alike, so we must harness their diversity and variations in natural and climatic conditions, geographic features, historic and cultural developments, demographic and social changes, national and regional specificities, and economic prosperity. This requires tailor-made responses and solutions that correspond to each territory's specific needs. Rural areas are active players in the European Union's green and digital transitions through sustainable production of food, preservation of biodiversity and the fight against climate change. They play a key role in achieving the European Union's Green Deal, farm to fork and biodiversity targets. In parallel, the rollout of new technologies in rural areas will be indispensable to making Europe's digital decay a reality. Reaching the targets of the European Union's digital ambitions for 2030 can provide more opportunities for the sustainable development of rural areas beyond agriculture, beyond farming and forestry, developing new perspectives for the growth of manufacturing and especially services and contributing to improved geographical distribution of services and industries. The long-term vision bridges gaps and builds synergies between all European policies. This goes way beyond any particular policy or fund. The vision is more about the way we look at rural areas and perhaps more importantly, the way they look at themselves. This is also the genuine value added of the long-term vision to create a new momentum for rural areas by using all the resources available to support the social and economic development of rural areas and make them vibrant, dynamic and attractive. I'm confident that this vision, which is supported by a strong action plan, will equip us with the necessary tools to encourage these regions to become confident, innovative and competitive and to improve the quality of life for their citizens and ultimately to guarantee the green and just recovery we need for Europe. A final point, a request to all of you. Your contribution to the vision is impressive. We need it again in the context of unprecedented exercise in deliberative democracy that is the Conference on the Future of Europe. The voices of the rural communities must be heard in this context too. Go online to our multilingual digital platform, organize events, upload your outcomes on the platform and make your voice heard. I want to thank you very much and I look forward to our continued collaboration. Thank you very much. So this is the, uh, the message from the Commission, Vice President Schuitza, on the future of rural areas. And if I may, I would like then to pick up on some important messages that with recovery and resilience plans on the way to be adopted, we need to quickly put them into effect. We need to be smart, we need to deliver on political commitments, we need to do something not for the rural areas, but with the rural areas. And I will start with Anastasius, because you are responsible to implement, for implementing the National Spatial Planning Policy Programme. Could you give us some insight into how to build the right structure to implement this long-term vision for areas, like in Portugal. Do you see a need for multi-level governance? Do you see a need for some 
good organization of actions to transform vision into reality. Thank you very much for your question and uh, thank you very much for the invitation for being here. It's an honor and uh, I would like to thank on behalf of the National Directorate for Territory. Uh, yes, uh, I think everything is important at this time. Uh, I would like also to highlight one other message that uh, the Mrs. Vice President uh, told us, that it's our vision aims to be greater than the sum of all parts. Mm. And I think this is a very interesting message because, uh, well, we cannot do or implement any strategy if we don't think that we all need to be part of it. Part of it. Uh, so it's important to plan, it's important to know what way we need to take. And uh, fortunately, we have a plan in Portugal that considers territory in the center of the policies. So we can speak to other political sectors in a way they can understand what we want. And yes, we can understand what they want as well. But we need to, li to listen not only the political set sectors, but also the people that are in all places. And to listen to people, it's to be attentive to their concerns and what they think matters really much. Uh, and I think that uh, it is this connection between the, the strategic planning, not only at the EU level, but also at national level, but how does this, this perspective, these strategic options, go to the, the people that are in those rural areas, in those places, and again, how do the, the, their concerns can go up to, to the Commission and to the European uh, concerns. But I think, yes, I think we have a path. Uh, I think we have a very good opportunity uh, and I think that uh, we need to be attentive, we, li we need to be to learn and to have a strategy to, to move on. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now to Mr. Cordeiro. A very important question of how, how to implement, how to leave no one behind and probably um, the question that is essential to be posed for uh, policy makers at regional level is do we have capacities, do we have resources in rural areas among the uh, local and regional governments? Do we have the know-how and do the people understand the message of the Commission and even the messages from the national governments on recovery and resilience plans? What's your reflection on that? Well, good morning to everybody. First, I would like to greet uh, not only um, our moderator, but also my, my fellow speaker, um, Anna Seixas. And I would like to uh, thank you for this opportunity, opportunity on behalf of the Committee of the Regions. And it is in that capacity that I'm here today as first vice president of the Committee of the regions. I think it's, um, well, you have a lot of, of a lot of questions in just one, but let me try to explain. First of all, uh, I think that we must be aware of the opportunity that the current situation uh, represents uh, not only a challenge, of course, but also an opportunity to change. We are not only uh, we're not talking only about recovery, to put things back where they were before the pandemic. What we are talking about is to use this opportunity to change a lot of issues, to reconfigure a lot of issues in our society, in our communities, so we can achieve faster and better a lot of goals that we have set for, uh, for ourselves. Green and just recovery is one of those issues. And the situation of rural areas represents a good challenge for, uh, for this. Now, how can, we, how can we put that in practice? How can we uh, put that working? But I think there are mainly three issues that should be considered and are very, very important for the capacity and the ability of rural areas and their representatives uh, to use this. First, knowledge. It's very, very important to increase 
to, to go deeper in all the data of subnational level. And um, I think S Fund can play a crucial role. It has played, and it surely it will continue to play a role in providing knowledge, providing data. There is no political decision without data. And I must say that sometimes when I was responsible for, I was in an executive position, sometimes this data, especially put in a broader context of the European uh, Union, is very, very important. So this would be the first thing, knowledge, the mapping of information at subnational level. I think it's key to create a real understanding of what's at stake. Second, empower all levels of governance. And this would lead us to a very interesting discussion. But to empower all levels of governance means not only to, to invite um, national governments to take into account the positions of uh, local and regional authorities, but maybe to go further, maybe to, to have that as, um, as a necessary step so the policies could be better implemented. Why? Well, because it's, it's very simple, the importance that local and regional authorities have in, um, in, in public spending, in, invest, in public investment, in knowing uh, in a more deeper way the reality of those areas. Third, we need sensible legislators. And um, I think all the knowledge that uh, we have must be put in place so we can have right decisions at all levels of uh, governments. And this means, of course, that um, uh, the, the, legis the legislative, and not only the legislative, but also the executive, are very, very important for that. As fun, and I think with the Portuguese presidency is um, probably one of the, uh, Portugal is one of the countries that has a better knowledge of this. We have experience with Portu with uh, uh, the Azores and Madeira and experience of, uh, re of um, autonomous regions with uh, legislative powers. So those three areas are of the utmost importance if we want to, um, to have this opportunity grabbed and this challenge, this challenge uh, overcome with success. I would mention these three, but is this enough? No, it's a constant dialogue. It's a constant um, um, monitoring issue. But mainly, and I would like to conclude with this remark, it's important to not to send um, contradictory, um, contradictory uh, issues. Let me give you an example. Um, in some areas of policies, we are at European level, going in the opposite direction of reinforcing the role of communities, of subnational um, uh, entities. I can give you two examples. First of one about the common agriculture policy that in one of uh, its previous uh, approaches and very recently, I think this was changed, of course, by pressure also of the European Parliament, the idea of excluding um, regions from the capacity of management of mainly the pillar, the second pillar, uh, and concentrating that at national level, this goes in the opposite direction of having this um, uh, speech about the importance of regions of rural areas. Second example, if you consider uh, all the uh, financial multi-annual financial frameworks, you can see there is an increasing number of resources allocated to programs that are managed directly by the European Union uh, and the cuts in the programs and the resources that are managed by regions and by states. 
This goes in the opposite way. So it is important to have a clear message. The Committee of the Regions is willing and is uh, ready to uh, assist, to alert, but also this must be uh, a concern for the ones who decide, who have the executive power, not only at European level, but also at national level. There is no strong policy that cannot, that does not um, captivate uh, the, the attention and the willingness of the people uh, to whom it's directed. And local and regional authorities are key for having this involvement, for having this um, adherence to uh, those policies. So I think those areas are very important. I'm sorry, I took too long to express uh, uh, my position about your, your, your question. Thank you very much. I think that's important uh, statements from you, Mr. Cordeiro, about the role of local and regional authorities to be empowered on par with the other decision-making levels in as being very close to the ground, to the close to the real life of the citizens, to be able then to put their priorities into the legislative framework and into the operative framework for the programs and plans and EU funds if they are dedicated to uh, well sectoral policies as you just mentioned and I do appreciate your kind words about ESPON and the role of ESPON in providing hard facts, providing evidence, providing data as a basis for solid decision making at all levels of governance. I think this is important. We strive to give some incentives for the better informed policies to also respect the need for this territorial dimension because no territories are same. We have different characteristics, we have different challenges, but also we can connect across the territories. And now about connecting. Question to Anastasius is about this knowledge and this empowerment. Do you perhaps give, give us some examples how well or maybe how poor you've been able then to connect the different levels together in implementing your national program. Are there any success stories that you as a representative of the EU presidency country would like to share with our audience and also other member states? Yes, thank you very much. Yes, I appreciate really much the, 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 the words from Mrs. Mr. Cruzeiro. It is really important, the three things that he mentioned. Um, and yes, I would like to, to, to add uh, another idea that it's, um, we, need, uh, we need to be positive. We need to have a positive narrative because we need to deliver results. And uh, so to deliver results, we need to ha get everybody on board and understand what we are talking and what are our, what are our uh, objectives uh, and our visions to the, to the territory. And I think, before answering to, to your question, yes, I think that we have something right now that is important as well, because we have common goals. When we talk about social Europe, when we talk about green Europe, just Europe, uh, we always we all of us have an idea how, what about would be this Europe. And we just need to talk about it and to understand what are the ideas from the different sectors, from the le different levels of governance. Because for, I think that a local level of governance should have a different idea from social Europe that we, when we are at national or uh, we are at European uh, level. So talk about things, discuss, present, and understand, I think it's really important in this process. Because we have also common threats. Uh, we are not talking about governance, but we, we have major threats that are related to climate change. Everybody is, uh, uh, is afraid, how can I say it, about uh, climate change, and it, it really changes our way of, of, of think uh, thinking things, and demographic challenges, and also uh, other things that are more, co more connected to local process, like loss of biodiversity and so on. So, yes, uh, I think this, this is a very complex process, uh, but I think we as territorial planners 
are, are acquainted with complexity. Uh, and so we think about all these things and uh, we try to reach uh, at national level, as an example, as you asked uh, me to, to say, it, uh, we had our national program for policy uh, um, that uh, we have. It's a national program for special planning, uh, planning policy uh, that is, uh, in fact, it has been presented to the, to the parliament. It has been approved by a law in 2019. And after that, we, we realized that we could not stay with a process, with a plan, with, with 50 measures, more political measures, and do nothing about it. Mm -hmm. So besides taking the territory in the center of policies, we decided and we proposed, and it was approved by then, that we need to, co to, to build um, a sector, intersectorial forum. So we have all major actors uh, at national and at regional level. We have the regions, the autonomous regions like Azores and Madeira, well represented, that they, they they are part of the core of this process. So we, we talk among each other about things that are important in the way to, to implement this, uh, this planning process, this planning program, uh, special planning program. And you have, we have very good results. For instance, the, the, the policy brief that we built together uh, regarding long-term vision for rural areas was not only um, something that we built with ESPEN at national level, but we so we present it to our intersectorial forum and we have the feedback and what they think about it. Uh, and so we deliver the, the results that, uh, that we did. So yes, I think this way of have a, have a forum where we can speak and we can talk about problems, not in a very institutional way. That's the, that's the main thing. We no, don't need to be very institutional. We need to go there and be, and be able to think, to say and to present our problems and discuss them. We having a common vision and a common goals and also be aware of what our problem, common problems are. So yes. Thank you. Dear panelists, a perhaps provocative question then to both of you. Do we have territorial leaders? Because implementation of these programs and plans requires that we understand the needs of our communities because they should also express their needs, they should articulate their needs, their expectations for how to make their life good, the quality of life to be even better. So um, probably we need to consider that there is a need for uh, territorial leaders, the leaders of those actions, the leaders of those movements, the leaders of those measures, so that what the governments are going to implement is well received on the ground and based on real needs. And if, if you confirm that we need territorial leaders, who these persons should be? Should that be young females, perhaps, in rural areas? Should that be something else, someone else? Should we need to include also some stakeholders that probably we never thought about who are essential in delivering these plans? Is it the enterprises? Is it the NGOs? So the floor is yours. What do you think about this idea? Territorial leadership. That's important in order to turn the visions into realities. We need to have the full support of the people on the ground. Any of you then, Mr. Cordeiro, perhaps, you worked a lot with communities in Azores regions and also in the committee of the regions, you definitely also discussed these issues of leadership. Well, well I think if you don't have territorial leaders, uh, you don't have territorial uh, communities, you don't have territorial uh, interests, you don't have, uh, at least you don't have the, the, the correct expression, let me put it this way, of, um, of, um, of those identities. Uh, of course, it's not the question of having a territorial leader on opposition or um, uh, meaning the opposite to all those other aspects, to all those other stakeholders that you mentioned. I think it's part of uh, territorial leadership to have the ability to gather all those stakeholders 
settlers in a common vision related with the region or the, the municipality represent. That, that's essential. Um, uh, that will lead us to a discussion about leadership. I don't think we're here <laughs> for that. But uh, I, I think it's very, very important to have the clear idea. This goes, and I think the process goes both ways. Okay. What I want to express with this is it's not only a question of having the communities well organized with well designed policies or to put it in a better way well designed interests uh, objectives goals it's also to have national governments and the european union able to take in account that within a framework of certain objectives regions are the better way to achieve those objectives so and sometimes this is this is very easy to speak like this but it's very very difficult to uh, it's very very uh, difficult to have it uh, on the ground because uh, there are a lot of issues that interfere that have uh, uh, influence in uh, in this idea so you ask do we need territorial leaders? Yes. But we need also national and European leaders that are able to understand that the better way to, uh, to have what we all want is having from bottom-up uh, approaches, from communities on the ground to have the idea to have the the ability to mobilize and to understand this only strengthens the project as a whole and not exactly that shatters or uh, diminishes the power of national uh, governments and European uh, Union. Thank you very much. Anna, back to you about your uh, your case. You mentioned the intersectoral dialogue that you involve the sectors that have something to say for the development of rural areas, because we know this is uh, a quite complex uh, problematics related with how to develop the, the, the rural areas in the best way. Could you perhaps let us know if within those measures you mentioned, a lot of measures that have been pinpointed in your document do you already agree on whom it will be to implement this? One single authority, one single organization, or a group of those working together in a concerted way? Yes, uh, thank you. Yes, of course, uh, when, we f when we decide what measures to take, political measures to take, of course, we, we identify the coordinator. And we, and we just have a, um, a meeting this week uh, that it was really important because we could, say, we could see all together, all the process together, because each coordinated coordinator uh, informed us about his measures and then we can, could have an overview of what, what happened. And we have a lot of initiatives. We have uh, hundreds of, I don't know if a hundred and something of initiatives to, to, to regarding territorial uh, the implementation of this national program. Now we need to, to, to speak to them and, and to find out if to, is the bad, best way to do it or is the technical way to do it, because I'm standing from the technical point of view. So from my perspective, uh, yes, of course, it's very important to have a, to have a leader someone who, who can talk and someone who can mobilize the population and uh, as Mr. Cordeiro said, because there is something that it's not really good for us as technicians that we have a program, we have a, a strategy and we go to the, to the local communities to present it and nobody, nobody appears or at least not too many people go to, to listen to us and then they don't interact, interact with us. So yes, I think the, the both the, both levels are important, the technical one and the political political one, uh, in, uh, to mobilize to mobilize people to make them uh, concerned about the results. So that's why in the beginning I was saying that delivery results is really important, not only to speak, 
but also to show uh, results. And uh, yes, we are looking forward to have some results to present Thank you. to, to just, everybody. To just emphasize what you said, uh, because it brings me back to the overall context. It's not that the plans for rural, for rural areas are prepared just for them, but must be prepared with the rural areas, yeah. with the engagement of the community leaders, the people who live there. Otherwise, they will not accept it probably as something that is brought over to them that perhaps is not consistent, coherent with their ideas, with their ambitions, with their anticipation of, as I mentioned again, the quality of life. Yeah. Because no region is the same. Yeah. And speaking about no region is the same, perhaps I can then introduce the, the matter of how to address the specificities of the rural areas. And both of you mentioned already the, the work of ESPON in that, in that regard, and I'm very happy to present our joint venture, <laughs> a joint product of the Portuguese presidency and ESPON, which is the policy brief on the prosperous future of all rural areas. And I think that's important then to take into account that uh, we have different processes for the uh, rural areas. We have different rural regions, as a matter of fact. And I do believe that Mr. Cordeiro soon, very soon, is going to react to those maps I'm presenting here because we have growing and shrinking rural regions. And we have the population that lives in the growing areas, but also the population that lives in the uh, shrinking areas. And as you may see here, that a lot of the EU regions actually are predominantly rural, and then they shrink a lot. And this is the process that lasts over many decades. So this brings me to the aspect of that we need some customized, tailor-made policies to respond to the needs of every single region because they belong to different categories. We also need to understand that there are different processes, different reasons behind the rural shrinkage. There are agricultural regions with low income population, there are mid-low mid mid income regions, there are also quite well-equipped rural regions. So the opportunities, as you were mentioning both of you, for those rural areas mean not the same in all the cases. So we need to be attentive to that specific diversity. And our policy brief is available for everyone to read. We also formulated some policy advice, how to turn these opportunities into, into reality. So, um, in that connection, I would like also to ask both of you some questions related with the processes we have noted in the rural areas. This is the shrinking, as mentioned. This is the aging. Many of those rural regions experience that the demographic structure is going worse. Young people tend to migrate to urban centers in pursuit of their individual paths and life and professional careers. We also see a lot of landscape transition issues because of the climate change. We have a number of natural hazards. We have floods in the rural areas. We have wildfires. We have forest devastations. And when speaking to the people there, I think maybe Mr. Cordero, we can start from you because you managed to successfully uh, label Azores in that respect as a destination for nature tourism. So not mass tourism, not something that is regarded with huge flood of people coming to your beautiful islands in order to spend some holiday, but you managed to do it in a sustainable way. So this is important perhaps also to learn on your lessons on this territorial specificity, because even the outermost regions are not the same. So if we can shed a bit of a light on your experience with, you know, how to address the specificities of rural areas. Thank you. Well, I, I, if I can share something with you about the, the, the Azores and the way we proceeded, um, I think it, it could be s summarized in this idea of transforming liabilities in assets. 
Um, what I mean with this is, of course, you have some situations that affect, especially a region that is uh, spread along 600 uh, kilometers in the North Atlantic, uh, nine islands, uh, 2,000 kilometers from Lisbon, uh, around 4,000 kilometers from uh, from um, Boston. But the idea is to have, have uh, what can be considered as liabilities and transform it in assets. For example, the idea of isolation help us to provide um, a touristic product that is more and more difficult to obtain in other uh, areas. Uh, the fact that we are in the middle of the Atlantic uh, gives us the possibility to transform our access to the sea that surround us in a way to provide knowledge, to provide um, a major field for investment um, and in, in study in science and technology, in blue biotechnology. Um, but of course, what we feel it's needed, it's sometimes to have the specificities duly considered, uh, mainly in what's related with the opportunity to invest with the European Union support. And sometimes what I felt at the time is that the design, it's, uh, it's one size fits all almost. Of course, the Azores as an outermost region, as Madeira, we have some specific considerations and specific measures. But from a development point of view, I think we could deepen uh, this approach in way to, with all the control, with all the audit, with all the monitoring, but to have a very uh, specific approach also with the support of the European Union. Um, tourism in the Azores is uh, one, I think it's one phase in uh, the de development process of our region, of our community. Um, it's an important step but it's not only, it's not just a goal. It's not just an objective. Uh, what we try to launch the, 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 the ground to build other areas where um, highly paid, specialized um, jobs could be put in place to the benefit of, uh, of our communities. Um, the marine uh, sciences and marine activities are an example of that approach. Space is also another example of that approach. So um, the idea occurs to me is you don't have to have this uh, to see that small cities, islands, outermost regions are a fatality. No, they are not. Uh, of course, they have very specific challenges. We have a lot to offer. It's only a question of looking at it and transforming. I'm sorry, but that's the idea that expresses better what I think. What could be perceived as liabilities, or as negative aspects and assets, transform that in something positive, in something that could drive, uh, could be a driver of, uh, of development. There are key issues uh, that I think it's very, very important is what's related with small communities, uh, rural areas, and the demographics. Um, we cannot have the same approach in infrastructures um, that other areas have. If you want to fight for the demography on those areas, you need to provide the same or even the better services, infrastructures that big cities, big communities offer. It's, it, it, not, it, it not only helps people to go there to feel that they can access in a more uh, uh, 
easy way, those services, uh, the ones that depend on infrastructures like school, health facilities and all that, but also it's a powerful driver for the economy and for development. That will lead us to a discussion about how we can, for example, in the field of eligibilities, to have this approach to what ha what's happening and what's needed in rural areas. But if you don't have that kind of approach, I'm sure it's, if not impossible, very, very difficult to fight for uh, demography and for a demographic growth and the inversion of the tendencies uh, in what's concerned with demography in those areas. So those are some ideas, some, um, some, some issues that I would like to put on the table for, for uh, your consideration and discussion. Thank you very much, because it goes very much in line with our thoughts within ESPON that we are not able perhaps to fight the demographic change. We are not able to say to young people, you must stay where you were born, because there are no measures any government in demographic world, democratic world could do in that sense. But we should understand the demographic change and then provide the population with the services that they really need. And I think this is my question back to Anna about those services of general interest. Because one of the uh, highlights in our policy brief that it could be presented also in our slide here is that there are different drivers behind rural shrinkage. We have economic restructuring in rural areas. We have some locational disadvantages of some rural areas. We have peripherization in, uh, again, so towards economic activities and globalization and also some disruptive events. If we look at the interior of your country, do you have any good examples of this positive narrative? That it's not just, you know, the poor interior, poor regions, losing, suffering, weakening, but perhaps there is this positive drive that you've detected already through your work as implementator of the national program. Thank you. Yes, uh, yes, we do have. Uh, first, I always think that we need to have a positive narrative. So we, knew, we need to look to, to territories and to find out what are their assets, as Mr. Kudair said. I completely agree with that. Because sometimes we, make, we compare things, but thinking about with our urban mind. And that's not the case. We need to think that there is a rural mind as well uh, that, are, that has different assets and that is different resources. So we, need, we have a model that sometimes is connected to urban and not connected to, to it's, it's um, u useful and we can implement it in urban uh, regions but not in rural regions. For instance, uh, I give you an example. Uh, here, now we have in Portugal a lot of, of um, uh, ways to go with bicycles. Uh, I don't remember the, the word, sorry. Uh, we have it everywhere. In urban, uh, we don't have now, uh, we have, can have cars and we also can have paths to, to bicycles. But this is important in urban areas because in rural areas, people use bicycles. They don't need to have uh, specific ways to do that. And if someone from city, from an urban area, if I go to live in, into the country in, in a rural area, he can use the bicycle uh, as he wants. But this is a problem because also, uh, not a problem, but I think we, I'd like to compare with the, the access to the, to the, the service of interest. Or, of um, interest because um, we don't go to a hospital in a bicycle. So we can have ways to, 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 to give some uh, walk, uh, not walks, but going on a bicycle. But we, if we want to go to a hospital, we need to have a car and we have to, go, to have good access and good roads and a way to get there very, very quickly. So uh, I think it's really important what Mr. Cruzeiro said, and we are really concerned about that, is that we can provide in rural areas everything that we can provide in urban areas, mm. that people can move there. People need to trust. They have not only trust because they have all the service that they need, but also trust that uh, 
the investments are prepared and are have a vision of a long term perspective we don't know, we don't um, we cannot uh, have a proposal or have a strategy for rural areas that only takes one year or two years because moving to rural areas is a question of a lifetime experience if i want to move to a rural area i i, I want to stay there i i want to live there so i need to to have trustful policies and uh, trust trustful investments and this leads me also to uh, to something that i think is really important and it's also related with services is is related to connectivity uh, and with everything that is we have to ha we have to have skilled jobs people need to be well paid in rural areas and i think this is a concern with commission i could realize that when we were discussing the the long term vision for rural areas uh, document uh, policy brief uh, uh, that was something that uh, the commission said to me uh, i heard not to me but i heard in a in a in a meeting that we need to, to provide uh, well paid jobs uh, in rural areas not only the agriculture that we can do and when we can have in our backyard but we need to have um, good uh, good paid uh, jobs so people can need to uh, want to go there so we have to have a new economy on in rural areas this is everything is connected so uh, i would stay here and talk for a long time because i think this is everything is connected anyway i think that um, I think that the, the shrinking air, rural areas, the way the, the term shrinking can be like a barom, barometer. Uh, if the shrinking stops, it's because we have done something really important. Because as you said, it's not it's something that it's connected to a lot of things that happens in rural areas. Thank you very much. Uh, dear panelists, I'm displaying on the on the slide right now a very important aspect of vulnerability to natural hazards. This is also one of our, say, research areas within ESPON to offer policy advice based on the territorial characteristics, how much we are vulnerable to natural hazards and how to mitigate the disastrous effects of natural phenomena. And looking at this map, you also may see that we require customized, place-based, sensitive policy response here. So uh, my question back to Mr. Cordeiro will be, from your experience in the European Committee of the Regions, do you feel that our policy makers are well prepared to embrace the vulnerability to natural hazards? Are they prepared to have preventive measures, so to, in case it happens that we are already prepared to mitigate, to counteract, to minimize the losses, or is it something that the policy makers do not understand because it has not happened yet, perhaps, but we need to be prepared, I guess. Well, um... <clears throat> I don't want to make that kind of judgment about, uh, but I, I think sometimes we are uh, very well remembered that uh, the issues of climate change is not only a theoretical scientific issue, it has impact in the life of populations. When you have a storm like we had here in the Azores in 2019, that completely destroyed a port in Flores Island, isolating the island from uh, the access to goods uh, that used to go there by by ship. Uh, you are very you are very sharply reminded that you need to do something and you need to act fast. The worst thing that had can happen is trying to, well, we'll get that later. Uh, and I, I must be honest, I think in some cases um, you don't have the very clear perception of the urgency of, um, of, um, of this issue. And once more, data like the one Aspen provides, and especially making clear uh, in some areas what is at stake, it's a very clear and important reminder of the urgency of action. 
Now, one issue is to be aware of this need. The other one is to have the ability and the possibility to act. Um, and here, I would like to stress this idea. It starts with, with each one of us, uh, with simple acts, with simple actions. Uh, and it not, it's not a question about the government. The government should act, of course, but it's not only their responsibility. And I think once more, that is, is the responsibility of leaders uh, to make this message very clear about the urgency, about the dimension of this task, and about the fact that each one of us has a role to play. It depends on each one of us. In that sense, what I experience within the committee of the regions and because of my work as uh, that this is a growing uh, aware there is a growing awareness of the urgency of um, of action um, but i think there is a very good margin of progression to improve uh, this awareness let me put it this way Thank you. So there is still a room for improvement, you would say, even yes. among your peer colleagues representing the regional authorities, that they understand the, the threats behind being too much vulnerable to natural hazards without any action or preparedness measures put into the plans and into the framework of, to action. I think it's uh, not only about uh, political regional uh, leaders. I think uh, it's um, all across political institutions. There is a very good margin of progression to improve the awareness of this issue. Thank you very much. Back to Anna. How well you are endowed with this vulnerability preparedness measures when implementing your program? Because this is probably the matter also for your intersectoral dialogue to have taken, or only perhaps in the future, to take into account that even within Portugal, we have different colors, different shades of red and brown, meaning some areas that are more exposed to natural hazards, some are less. And this probably also requires some dedicated measures, some sensitive policies and sensitive measures to implement. And also perhaps, as Mr. Cordeiro was saying, the knowledge of those territorial leaders and community members to understand that when it comes, when it happens, they could be too late to start planning. What's your view on that? Yes, that's right. Yes, we are aware. In fact, we are really aware. Uh, our national program uh, for special planning uh, has considered the climate change and the risks. We have a map of all risks in Portugal and in, uh, in the islands and in regions, auto, autonomous regions as well. Uh, and uh, yes, we are really aware about our, our risks and our vulnerabilities. And, and we have a lot of them. They are from different kinds. Well, you can say that climate change is the motor for all of them, but you can have, and I was looking to the, to the map that you yeah, is now displayed, and you can see that, that we have a different clouds, but you can see in the southern part, we have very dark uh, color. And then we have also a, a small, a, a, an orange in the other part near the ocean, and also the islands that are all in red. Uh, yes, but there, there are different hazards when, if we, if we, when we look to that, that colors, we have different hazards. Um, and we need to be aware, and we are really aware. And in fact, I think the, um, when we are planning, and at the technical level, we are aware, I think at the political level as well, but I think that people in places need not only to be aware of, uh, of, of, of the risks, and of course they are better than us, uh, I'm sure, but they, only, they also think, need to, to be aware of the importance of the, the resources that they get in those territories. Uh, just an example uh, that I think it's important. Uh, the value of the natural value of some territories need to be uh, highlighted and people need to be aware of the importance of the value that they have in the, that territories regarding, for instance, vulnerabilities 
We have here uh, uh, in Portugal, we have, for, for example, we drink water in some places that water is kept in dams, in reservoirs, about 120 kilometers from, from those places. And people live there around those reservoirs and they need to be, they have some conditions to, they cannot do everything they want and they need to improve, for instance, the, the way the, the forest is, is managed in the, around, or surrounding those territories. Why don't we as a society understand that if they stay there and if they, they manage the forest, for instance, in a different way, in a more natural, in a more way that is concerned about, about biodiversity, for instance, and we can keep, keep better water to drink 20 kilometers uh, away so far, uh, far away. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a, um, a role that they play. This is something that it's a service that they, they, they provide to, to others. And I think the society needs to be aware of those services. And back to the rural areas, this is a, a thing that I, 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 I think that we need to highlight it. And those people need to be paid for the service that they, they provide. Because water is better to 200 to, to, kilome to, to 100 kilometers away and maybe we don't have to, to expend so much money to treat it to drink it mm -hmm. so this is everything is really connected but uh, I think they are aware and but they have um, important assets that need to be bring to this uh, to this process and be uh, considered thank you very much Anna mr. Cordero back to you about the learning processes. We don't live in an isolated world, so uh, also um, through your work with the European Committee of the Regions, you definitely understand also the potential of learning from each other, one region from another region. Do you see any lessons that Portugal may learn from the other regions in how to provide prosperity for rural areas and do you perhaps also see that Portugal can give some very good examples of best practice to some other regions in Europe? I think in the, in the globalized world we live in, it's very, very difficult not to uh, have access to uh, Practices, best practices from other uh, from other countries or from other regions. Um, the committee of the regions, I may say, is also a, and other uh, regional um, cooperation institutions is uh, is very keen and very aware of uh, of that. There are very good examples of programs and issues where sharing best practices. I'll give you an example about what's going on between the Committee of the Regions um, and, um, and also the, the European Commission about climate change exactly is one of the ideas to have uh, the sharing of best practices in what's concerned with the approach to the, in this platform that was launched a few weeks ago. But uh, the idea of having uh, a major uh, uh, possibility of sharing um, examples, of sharing um, uh, best practices is one inherent to the idea of the cooperation between regions and cities. Portugal has in the two areas as in uh, in the renewable uh, and marine uh, marine uh, uh, sciences as some uh, uh, areas and some regions that are i think very interesting um, uh, leaders mm -hmm. in in those areas um, so those three areas would be an example. I'm talking, of course, also by my region, where not only marine um, uh, marine sciences, but also in the field of renewable renewable energy, um, geothermal mainly is one of the areas where we've been uh, advancing, and also in this area to have it with uh, 
learning from other regions, not only in the European Union, but from other regions that are uh, developing further, more developed in, in these issues. Thank you very much. And a question for you also. Um, when implementing the programme, the spatial planning policy programme in, in Portugal, do you see uh, some positivities or potential to cooperate with some other regions, some other localities, some other countries, perhaps to reap some benefits, to draw some inspiration from what the others are doing, or do you implement it just within, mm -hmm. confined to the administrative boundaries of Portugal? Uh, well, we are very open-minded. Uh, in fact, uh, we, we all the, the process that are going, all, all, we would only have one border with Spain uh, and, uh, we, and the ocean. So, uh, physic, in the physical uh, way of seeing things, yes, of course, we are completely, we need to have, uh, we, and we are trying to have an implementation that goes uh, across border, they don't because biological, physical, biophysical aspects don't know borders, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to to think like that. Uh, and uh, yes, we we are trying to implement it um, in a in a concert in a way that we can match uh, the the objectives from both uh, sides of the of of those countries, but. Still, uh, but yet, uh, I think the examples, learning from each other, I think it's it's the best way to move on, because we don't need to invent the wheel. Sometimes mm -hmm. the wheel is, has already been invented for with for someone, and so we need to see if that will uh, it's important for us, or we can use it, maybe in a different way. Maybe it's still round, but uh, yes, uh, we can. We need to 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 exchange experience, and I would like to stress that. Maps like this uh, that Aspen produces. Um, I'm, uh, yesterday we were talking about, and uh, one of Aspen colleagues said that Aspen can provide information that no country can provide it from, for itself. And it's true. And if we can compare with others, I'm sure we can have ideas and uh, we can have some contacts and uh, try to change ideas. I think it's the best way to do it. We cannot do it otherwise, I think so. Thank you very much. I can't resist to ask both panelists in the concluding parts of our session on your message for ESPON. Because ESPON works a lot with data, with maps, with visuals to provide evidence on the territorial trends, on the territorial patterns, on the territorial drivers to all decision makers so that they understand that the, the impact of administrative borders because of some processes, Anna, you just mentioned that they don't know the borders, it's important to take into account. And now we are sadly going to leave the Portuguese presidency of the EU Council by the end of June and then move on to engage in a journey as ESPON with the Slovenian presidency. And instead of talking about green and just recovery as your political priorities, we'll be talking about the territorial perception of the quality of life. That is why I many times also emphasize the need to perhaps understand the quality of life by each of us in order to make well-informed policies. What would your messages be for ESPON? What should ESPON look for when we look at the rural areas, the prosperity of the rural areas, outermost regions, functional areas, islands, mountainous regions and so on? Mr. Cordeiro, as a policy maker, what would you say to ESPON? What we should do? Well, first of all, keep up the good work. <laughs> Second, um, be aware also that, and I think you are aware, of course you are aware, but let me just stress this idea. Um, I think in, in the field of this project, it's also important to have, uh, um, uh, to have in mind the differences between, uh, between regions. Um, some of the criteria, some of the questions, some of the indicators that could um, have very strong differences between each regions. But most importantly, um, I think the, the, 
the idea of S-Pan, not only as giving us a reading of our past, but also helping us to shape our future, giving us the tools to, uh, that help us to decide better, to um, compare, to call our attention to aspects where we need to intervene. Well, that, that's, um, uh, it's, it's priceless. Uh, it's, it's, uh, so the message would be, keep up the good work. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Anna, your message for Espon. At the executive level, when implementing your national policies, your national priorities, what kind of support you would expect from ESPON, even when the presidency of Portugal in the European Con Council of the European Union comes to an end? Would you like still to be engaged in the uh, joint ventures? Yes, with, of with course. Us? Yes, I'm sure we will like to, because I think uh, we only learning from each other and uh, we can we can do something uh, really different we can change something uh, and I think Espon give us that opportunity to compare and to, to realize how big or not so big is our problem in the, the European context and it's important sometimes we think about our problems that's our that's what we do for a living that's what we do every day but uh, be aware what is how are we seen from the Euro Europe and how we can compare to other countries in Europe it helps us to stay to to understand where we stand and I think Espan gives gives us a lot of information that we can use in every in very different uh, um, ways, and we can with different sectors. Um, so I think this is really important. The, the the other message is that we need to take all stakeholders on board. So we need to be able to communicate Espan to the stakeholders at local level, at regional level. They need to understand that Espan information is important. They can use it and they can have um, also uh, be inspired because I think Espon is also all about, it's all about being inspired. So yes, I think um, we, I would like to keep the good work with, uh, with Espon and we are completely available to, to, talk, to, to pass on to the Slovenian presidency everything that we learn. But because as I said in the beginning, I think it's all about learning and all about learning with each other. Mr. Codeiro, back to you. It's a sort of a ping pong game I'm, I'm trying to exercise right now. Hope that both of you don't mind it. Because communicating is very difficult. You have to not only speak the same language, and you know in Espen we use English. So it's very difficult for us to just directly from our EGTC, the operational body, speak with the communities because of the language barrier, and also because the terminology we've been using in Espon, vocabulary, is sometimes very difficult to comprehend. Perhaps also something you've came across in your work for the Committee of the Regions, and also for even within your work for the uh, regional government of Azores. How to speak to the people that they understand the message? Is it a matter of phrases? Is it a matter of vocabulary? Is it a matter of very plain information that the people will be able to understand and realize? What was your, what's your experience? What could you recommend also to us to talk as respond to the people? Relate the data you have with something that means something to the local communities. Uh, I think that's the best way to pass the message. Uh, not only the scientific, the technical approach, that's important, of course, but you want, if you want to have a broader uh, uh, interest, relate, give examples of relating the data you have with something that means a lot to those communities. Some examples, some... Uh, some um, issues that motivate them. Uh, that, I think, in my opinion, it's, imp 
the way to achieve this is to have a very, very strong connection with the uh, the local uh, institutions, the regional institutions that could help to provide this this connection, because of course some 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 in some cases that would um, people are interested in knowing and the, the technicalities are not a barrier, but sometimes and if you want to have a a, a brother. This way of connecting with them, relating with uh, issues, with causes uh, that mean something to them, I think it's the best way. So a bit playing on emotions so that they understand how to associate the ESPON messages. No, no, no it's uh, probably I didn't express myself in the, the, the best way. It's not a question of emotions. It's a question of uh, having issues from the communities uh, that could, for example, spatial uh, planning, that means uh, coastal areas, that means a lot to people that live in islands. And if, if, if the technicalities are translated into what they can relate, it is important to them, that's the idea I want to pass, I think it's the best way to pass the message. Thank you. We'll take it on board, of course, to be even more efficient and effective in, in speaking with local and regional authorities. Dear panelists, um, I think we are being uh, followed by a couple of hundred people, which is, I think, a good success. And what your message to the uh, audience could be? What would you like the audience to remember from this specific debate? What are your most important standpoints? Mr. Cordeiro again, what would you say to the audience? Well, first of all, thank you for your uh, for being here. I think that's the first idea. And the, the, the second is not only the theme of uh, this session about the recovery, but also the work of ASPON uh, should more and more promoted, more and more um, um, publicized, because it's the way to strengthen not only this body, this project, but also a way to um, strengthen the causes, the ideas, in this case, of the just and green recovery. So, to put it simple, spread the word. We will do so, definitely. Anna Seychelles, back to you. Your message to the audience. Well, I'll not be so innovative. I think spread the word, be inspired, um, go to see the, the, the information, the, all the information that it's provided. Have time to do that. Time is really important. Uh, and well, I would like just to, 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 to end with information. It's time to act. We have to, do, to deliver results. We have a lot of studies. Uh, we have a lot of information, but we have to deliver results. And that's what Mr. Cordero was saying. We need to deliver the results to talk to locals, to understand what, uh, what are the results and to understand the process. So that would be my, my final message. Thank you very much. The above has been my honor and pleasure to have had you with me here. I'm very happy that you accepted the invitation to be part of this um, panel, knowing that it has been awfully early morning for you, Mr. Cordeiro, in Azores. But uh, we hope that you have found this time with us really interesting, really perhaps intriguing, that some of the questions uh, could have been provocative, perhaps going far, being concrete, being explicit. And also then, Anna Sessions, for your time with us and all the journey we have had with you during this presidency and your team that we cooperated so well to deliver the, the policy paper on the prosperous future for the rural areas and all the work that also you are promoting through your ministry, through your intersectoral dialogue about ESPON, about the way we try to inform policy making across Europe so that they understand what territorial evidence is about and that we can turn the territorial evidence into knowledge for all, hopefully all decision makers. So we are going to spread the word, definitely, and knowing also to your kind engagement in, in our debate. And uh, to the audience, we would like to thank you very much for being with us for this first debate. 
Tomorrow there is yet another debate. We also have our ESPON online workshops and all details you may find on our website espon.eu where you have, can free of charge enroll in our program and then to witness also interesting discussion on results of some of the latest ESPON thematic evidence projects. So thank you very much for being here with us and stay tuned to ESPON. Goodbye. Thank you.